Welcome back to another episode of What's Up Prof. Hi Walter. Hi Martin. Are you doing well? I'm shorn like a lamb. <laughs> and now the wind has not been tempered, so I'm freezing. <laughs> yeah, no, it's crazy. We mem one day we have 38 degrees Celsius. The next day it's 10 degrees Celsius. Yes. It's probably climate change. It's called global cooling. Oh, okay. Well, we've got a very important message today again. It's part of the most important messages to be taken to the world. Yes. So let's pray and ask the Lord to help we us. We need prayer. Our Heavenly Father, thank you that we have the opportunity to discuss this wonderful message again today. We ask that you enlighten our minds, guide us with the Holy Spirit, and protect us with your holy angels. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Martin, it's possible that people will take offense uh, as to what we will be saying, but uh, a serious study will show that it is actually a help mm -hmm. so that people can discern between the various options out there. And discernment is the name of the game. Be careful lest anyone deceive you. Mm. The first words that we read that the Lord says in the book of Revelation. Yes. So we're going to talk about the second angel today. And it's only one verse in yeah. the whole Bible that so we're talking about. So it will, it's, it, it will be a short discussion. It will be a very short discussion. <laughs> the trouble with this verse is you don't know what to leave out. <laughs> <laughs> the problem is not what to put in, but what to leave out. Because this is a very loaded verse. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't, isn't a standalone verse. No. Because this message is repeated in Revelation chapter 18. So we have to split the information. Yes. So we cannot put everything into one verse. We have to put it into the greater context later of Revelation 18. So we will be looking at some basic things, and that's a problem already. But let's see how far we can go. Let's hope that uh, we can finish under four or five hours. Right. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Revelation 14, verse 8. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all the nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Martin, that's a very loaded verse. Mm. And there are a number of features in it that are important. And there is this message of Babylon is fallen, and it's repeated. Mm. That's number one. And why has she fallen? Because she made the nations drink of the wine. That's doctrine of the wrath of her fornication, her apostasy. So apostate doctrines from Babylon have been transferred into the thinking pattern of humanity, the mm. nations, which includes the churches. Now, once the nations start thinking like the churches think, then church and state working together could become problematic, right? True. Yes. I'm interested to see that the new speaker of the house said he has a problem with the separation of church and state. He wants them to be together. Yeah. That's a fulfillment of prophecy. That's pendulum swinging, getting to where prophecy will be fulfilled. Correct. But let's see why. Mm. And this is very important. So we want to know a few things. Now we've spoken about these many in many lectures, but so that people can have one reference point, let's just repeat some things. We need to know who is Babylon. Yeah. We need to know why the message that it has fallen is being repeated. Mm -hmm. We need to know what the wine is. Yes. And we need to know how to influence the nations. That's it. Correct. And it's a great city. Mm. So let's jump right into it. There was a literal fall of Babylon. And obviously this is now a spiritual fall because literal Babylon no longer exists. Exactly. Right? Fall. Fell. So let's look at the original. Daniel 5 verse 25. And this is the writing that was written when the hand appeared and wrote a against the wall, right? Mm -hmm. And it said, Mene, mene, tekel, ufarsen. 
Now there's also a repetition there. Mene yeah. mene. Mm -hmm. It's repeated, right? This is the interpretation of the thing. Mene, God has numbered thy kingdom and finished it. So basically it says, God has numbered thy kingdom and finished it. God has numbered thy, fin thy kingdom and finished it. So historically we have to look at why there are two components. Now in the time that this was written, Belshazzar was the king who ruled over secular issues. Mm -hmm. But his father was the real king. Yes. And he ruled over the spiritual issues. So there was a spiritual component and a secular component, and they were united. Yes. Let's say church and state was together. Together, ruling. It is one of the components of Babylon, mm. that the state will ensure that the religious components of Babylon are also adhered to. Yes, that's it. That is why King Nebuchadnezzar, when he took the captives to Babylon, he made sure that they learn everything about the Babylonian religion. He even changed their names to reflect the Babylonian religion. Yeah. So we need to remember that. Tackle thou art weighed in the balances and are found wanting, and Paris, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. So Babylon was conquered. And that was the typical destruction. Yeah, the literal. The literal. So there's an anti-typical one that we're talking about now. So we need to know what the attributes were of Babylon. Mm. Now, where did Babylon start? Yeah. We have to go way back into history. So we go back to Genesis, chapter 11, verse 9. All right, so we have to go back to the survivors of the flood. Yes. They had increased in numbers, mm -hmm. and then they started to build the city, and they built the Etamanangting, the Tower of Babel. Mm. Now, why did they build it, Martin? Because they did not believe what God said. God said he would not destroy the f world by a flood again. Mm. And they disbelieved God. Mm. And so they decided to build this tower so that he would no longer be able to destroy them with the flood. Yes. It was to reach right up to heaven, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So it's a system based on a disbelief in the Word of God. Yeah. And it's a system of we will take care of ourselves. Now, the builder of the city and the power that ruled over it was Nimrod. Yes. And he was a, a warrior before the Lord. Yeah. But he was a warrior actually against the Lord. That's it. His name means rebel. Right. So here was this rebel. And he was the grandson of Ham. Yeah. Now Ham obviously had esoteric knowledge, mm -hmm. knowledge of rebellion, because you see his rebellious nature f right from the beginning, and we've dealt with the, what he did and how it was exposed, and how the curse trick down via Canaan and Nimrod was the one who again officially reinstated this rebellion mm. against God. And the whole religion of Babylon revolves around the legends that took place. Of course they trace themselves back to before the flood. Yes. And this religion emanates from Cain. Mm -hmm. And Cain made his son Yes. The custodian of his thinking patterns. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And his son, of course, was Enoch. Enoch. Not the good Enoch. No. Let's not confuse him. Mm -hmm. Enoch, son of Cain, is the first one to build a city. And that's why it's called a city. Yeah, they were city builders. They were city builders. But the city mm. stands for global governance. We will rule the entire world. Mm -hmm. Now, God stopped their little plan by confusing their languages. And it says in Genesis eleven nine, 9, Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. So all of a sudden they spoke different languages, and they could no longer communicate, and then you had the different nations. Yes. 
That was to prevent a unified world government. Yeah. Are we striving towards one? A united nations. How many years have they been striving for that? Millennia. From the beginning. Yeah. From the day that they were confounded, they have been striving to get unity. And this must have been a major problem, right? For sure. And they couldn't understand each other anymore. So within the secret echelons, they then decided to come up with a plan. Mm. And this plan was to no longer use language per se to communicate whatever their secret doctrine was, yeah. but to use symbols and signs so that it couldn't be confused any longer because anybody can look at it and make a conclusion. And if you were an initiate, then you could understand. So this is actually a religion of rebellion against God, mm -hmm. disbelieving God, relying on humanity to take care of its own future, yeah. excluding God. That's Babylon. But it is a religious organization powered by government. Yes, so it's a mindset. It's People a mindset. have a religious mindset and it's not the mindset of God. No, it's not the mindset of God. So here is a, is a depiction of the origin of secret societies in the world. And this comes from Gary H. Carr's book, En Route to Global Occupation. In other words, they want a world government, right? Mm -hmm. How do you achieve this? Because you have to work underground to overcome the surface uh, opposition. Mm -hmm. Let's put it that Ex way. Okay, exactly. So... so yeah. There's a special no behind the scenes that they know and the rest is in the Correct. dark. And of course, it's very important, Martin, that the, the conditions which exist in any particular population or any language group be diluted. Mm -hmm. So let's say you have a nation and they speak French. Mm -hmm. Then you have to make sure that many different cultures and languages come into that culture so that it isn't one culture that dominates but all and they have to somehow compromise yes so you have to bring migrants into countries like france or germany or italy or greece or wherever you have to get the migrants in there so that you can change the collective mindset so that you can get global occupation mm. you have to get compromise yes now, compromise politically is one thing, mm -hmm. but compromise religiously is totally a different kettle of fish. In, in Christianity, in the doctrine of Jesus being the only way to heaven, you cannot compromise. That's a, that's a major obstacle. Yeah. That has to go. So the ancient mystery religions are to be used in order to get back to the Babylon state mm. where everybody is one and has the same mindset. Yeah. But that mindset is a mindset of rebellion. That's it. Okay. So you have the ancient mystery religions of Babylon, Egypt, India, Persia, Greece, and they were all forms of pantheism. Do we find pantheism in the papal encyclicals? Yes, very much so. All right. Then you had Kabbalism. Mm -hmm. Now, Kabbalism is a mystic religion. Mm -hmm. Now, much of Judaism today is based on Kabbalism and the other religions as well. Actually, the whole uh, occult world traces itself back to the Kabbal. Mm -hmm. And then you had Gnosticism. Gnosticism is where man is deified. Yeah. So you, you must believe in yourself because you can be God. Trust your heart, Martin. Mm. But the heart is <laughs> deceivable. And it's above all things. And it's desperately wicked. <laughs> so how do you want to trust mm -hmm. it? Anyway, Gnosticism was a great preparatory movement. Mm hmm and it was particularly prevalent in the time after Christ. Yes. And some of the Gnostics were very, very busy when it came to biblical manuscripts, like 
Oregon, for mm. example. He was a Gnostic. Yeah. And his, one of his disciples of, or followers was Eusebius. Mm. And uh, he was a bishop that was very favorably inclined to and a flatterer of Constantine. Mm. And certain changes were made which were sanctioned by the Gnostics, which, which were sanctioned by the Gnostics, but should be refuted with every power of your being if you were a Bible believer. Changes you mean? Changes in the scriptures? Changes to biblical manuscripts. And then you have, of course, the flagship manuscripts on which modern Bibles are based. For example, the Sinaiticus and the Vaticanus. They were probably contaminated by Gnosticism. And then you had the Knights Templars. Now, that is a particularly interesting organization that is tightly linked to Catholicism. Mm. And it was the military arm, yeah. the one to take the message, the wine, to the entire world. That's why they used crusades. Yes. Now, the Knights Templars were disbanded, but the, their descendants are very, very active. Mm -hmm. So today, the descendants of the Knights Templars would be the Knights of Malta, yeah. the secret organizations within Catholicism, and the Jesuits, of course. And then you had Rosicrucianism, which was basically alchemism. It is uh, uh, the secret of the occult science. Mm -hmm studied in diagrams, ah, etc., okay. mm -hmm. and symbols. And out of that, Excellent. you had Freemasonry and the Illuminati. Mm. Now, the Illuminati was founded by Adam Weishaupt, who was a Jesuit. Yes. And Freemasonry is based on this ancient occult religious system. If people want to know more, they mm -hmm. can look at the secret behind secret societies, for example, in yes. the Total Onslaught. Yes. series. All right. Now, Freemasonry infiltrated the echelons of politics and religion. Mm -hmm. So if you look at many of the great religious leaders of the last centuries, they were all Freemasons, yep. whether they came from the Protestant world or another world. That's it. The Islamic world has Masonic lodges. The Jewish lodges... Christian lodges, so-called, yeah. they infiltrated organizations such as the World Council of Churches, the international banking elite, the American and European secret political societies, and Marxism. Mm -hmm. So they're playing a nice Hegelian game. Yeah, it's the same with um, your revolutions, tyrants, and war yes. of there. Then you can see all the kings of the earth or the presidents they're also the same they're part of the freemasonry so they're sitting behind closed doors at the same table correct so all of this comes from babylon yeah and this is the way in which you're going to achieve world governance yeah you have to create unity of thought in the political realm or at least tolerance mm. and you have to create unity of thought in the religious realm or at least tolerance that means there can be no exclusivity. Yeah. So you cannot say one religion uh, is the only way because that would exclude the others. That wouldn't be unity. All right, And that gave rise to the New Age movement, which is heavily influenced by the Theosophical Societies. Mm -hmm. And the Theosophical Societies are the straightforward worship of Lucifer. And then you have many of the cults of the 1800s that are involved over there. So here in the New Age, you have new spiritual technology, you have self-hypnosis, you have subliminal persuasions, you have neuro-linguistic programming, you have all of these issues to change mindsets. Mm -hmm. And from the ancient religions, you have anything from witchcraft, sorcery, divination, spiritism, all of these things, and some of the practices of Hinduism, Buddhism, Shintoism, etc. All of this is part of Babylon. It's all part of Babylon. It's the power under the surface. Mm -hmm. You're supposed to know about it, 
but not to understand it unless you are an initiate yeah. or unless you've studied it. Mm -hmm. So let's get a few quotes just to put the background. Morals and dogma is, of course, the highest source in Freemasonry. You don't get a better source than this by Albert Pike. He says, every Masonic lodge is a temple of religion. That puts it beyond doubt. It's a religious organization. Yes. And its teachings are instruction in religion. This is the true religion revealed to the ancient patriarchs, which Masonry has taught for many centuries, and which will continue to teach as long as time endures. Now the patriarchs that they refer to are not the patriarchs of the Bible. Mm -hmm. They are eyewash. They are referring to their initiates, Enoch, son of Cain, mm -hmm. Nimrod. That's what they are referring to. Yes. They literally refer to the Tower of Babel as their structure. Mm. They are building the Tower of Babel. That's why they are the, they've got the set compass and square, because they are builders of they cities. The correct. And if you take the emblem of uh, the, the new Europe, you'll see that it is the Tower of Babel under construction. Yeah. Even like you showed in that one, that um, the Washington, D.C., the outlet, outlay of the city is Masonic. Yes, correct. All right, here's another Masonic source, Manly Palmer Hall, The Lost Keys of Freemasonry. The true Mason is not creed-bound. He realizes with the divine illumination of his lodge that as a Mason, his religion must be universal. That's a very key issue. Christ, Buddha, or Mohammed, the name means little, for he recognizes only the light and not the bearer. He worships at every shrine, bows before every altar, whether in temple, mosque, or cathedral, realizing with his truer understanding the oneness of all spiritual truth. Mm. So there goes absolute truth. That's it. So it's, it's hypocritical. He's behind. He can show something, but he's, what he believes is actually the opposite. Something totally different. And... The true light bearer cannot be Christ because he cannot be the only way. It cannot be Buddha and it cannot be Muhammad. So it must be someone else. And that someone else, they blatantly admit, is Lucifer. Mm. So it's a system of works against God. Yeah. So you have to become all things to all men. Mm. So Martin, if we look at the papacy then we see that they are all things to all men. Mm -hmm. For example, here are two pictures of Pope John Paul II being anointed with the sign of the tilak, which basically means that he's prepared to embrace the gods of the Hindus. Mm. And kissing the Quran, which basically means that he is embracing or showing reverence for its teachings. Yes. But it denies the atonement. Yes. It denies the sonship of Christ. There's no compromise. There's no gelling of these religions with Christianity. Nothing. So this is a compromise that excludes Jesus Christ. And it's a breaking of the first commandment. You shall have no other gods beside me. Definitely. Pope Francis had the Amazon... Um, idols there in the Vatican that was blessed by him. So... He's no different. It's, it's right it's through this time. It's a theme. It's the construction of the city. Yeah. And the city is Babylon. But the city's location can be in a different place, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you have Francesco Fratelli Tutti, all brothers. Now, the Bible talks about neighbors. Mm -hmm. All are your neighbors. But brothers is something else. When Jesus was told that his mother and his brothers and his sisters were waiting outside, his answer was, For whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same is my brother and sister and mother. Mm. So it's a very specific criteria. So who is my brother in Christ? The one who does the will of the Father. Mm. And didn't the father say, this is my beloved son, hear him? Yes. So if you don't adhere to the teachings of Christ, then you're not a brother. 
unfortunately. Then you might be a neighbor. Yes. And I must love my neighbor as myself. And I must be kind to my neighbor and not wish him any harm. But he's definitely not a brother in the faith. Yeah. So when he writes all brothers, fratelli tutti, that's a Babylonian concept. Yeah. So the Catechism of the Catholic Church actually teaches, for the Son of God became man so that we might become God, the only begotten Son of God wanting to make us sharers in His divinity, assumed our nature, so that He made man might make men gods. That's incredible, Martin. Sure. That is echoing the teaching of the serpent. Yes, to Eve. And here's another quote from the Catechism. Marvel and rejoice, we have become Christ. Mm. That's a New Age concept that we can become Christ. Mm. Uh, there's a book by Helen Shookman, which is called A Course in Miracles, mm. which basically teaches that you can become Christ or even much more than he was. So this is a blasphemous statement. And it is part of the Babylonian concept. Of yeah. course, Babylon also had mother and child worship. And there were different deities with different names, female and male, which were invoked. Mm -hmm. And Catholicism has the same by invocation of the saints and Mary. Let's see if we can find the same teaching in masonry, right? Mm -hmm. Manly Palmer Hall, 33 degree Mason, wrote, Man is a God in the making. George Steinmetz, a Masonic writer, writes, Be still and know that I am God, that I am God, the final recognition of the all in all, the unity of the self with the cosmos, the cognition of the divinity of the self. It's exactly the mm -hmm. same religion. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, J.D. Buck, Mystic Masonry, writes, The perfect man is Christ, and Christ is God. This is the birthright and destiny of every human soul. This is the teaching of the United Nations. This is where the Jesuits were involved. Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, he was basically the father of the New Age movement. Mm. Uh, the Blavatskys and the Alice A. Baileys, they are embraced by these organizations. It's a Babylonian system. Yeah. That old system, I mean, there was even pictures, I remember, of the United Nations that is as a form of the Tower of Babel. Absolutely. And the interesting thing is, they teach that we are this brotherhood here and that we must make our home on this earth. Yeah. This earth is the place where you receive your salvation, not something outside of you mm. and going to another place. So let's see if we can find this in the Jesuitical teaching. Yes, we've shown this slide before, but I think it fits. This is Paul Netter. He's, of course, a Jesuit theologian. For Jesus, the spiritful prophet, that's already a blasphemy. I can hardly read this stuff. The focus of his life and the relationship was the reign of God. That meant that he was not, as his followers have often been, church-centered. His primary concern was not to increase membership of his own movement or community. Rather, it was to transform people's hearts so as to transform their society. He actually writes the following. That's it. That's the crux of the problem. Christian dualism has so exaggerated the difference between God and the world that it cannot really show how the two form a unity. Mm. So he's breaking down what God said. Yeah. God said, love of the world is enmity <laughs> with God, right? And he changes it. He goes further and writes, without Buddha, I could not be a Christian. Now, Buddha is basically the negation of God. It's yeah. an atheistic religion. But the scriptures say, ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. So when the Babylonian system tries to rebuild that Tower of Babel, mm -hmm. it is a humanist activity. Yeah, it's a works-based one. It's a works-based one. And when it comes into a religious system, then you have to beware of it. 
Because either the Bible is right and there's only one way to salvation, or it is not right, and then you have the Luciferian side. Yeah. Let's see how far they go. Morals and Dogma again, Albert Pike, the top source in Masonry. Masonry, like all the religions, all the mysteries, hermeticism and alchemy, conceals its secrets from all except the adepts and sages, or the elect and uses false explanations and misinterpretations of its symbols to mislead those who deserve only to be misled. Hmm. That already is a statement that negates every Bible principle. Definitely. Jesus said, I did nothing in secret. This whole thing is based on secrecy. It's based on secrecy. So it is a Babylonian system. To conceal the truth which it calls light from them and to draw them away from it. Truth is not for those who are unworthy or unable to receive it. Does the Bible teach something like that? No, not at all. The, no. the Bible says the word is truth, so the whole word is truth it's and it's available to everybody. All right, because they say they would pervert it. So masonry jealously conceals its secrets and intentionally leads conceited interpreters astray. You are intentionally led astray by the Babylonian system. If you read this, then you understand why in the Middle Ages the papacy banned the Bible. Yes. Here's another statement from Blavatsky. She's the top occultist prophet, if you like. Lucifer represents life, thought, progress, civilization, liberty, independence. Lucifer is the Logos, the serpent, the savior. So there's a reversal. Mm -hmm. Lucifer becomes the Christ, mm -hmm. the word, the Logos. His word counts. And true Christianity is negated. To put it bluntly, she writes, it is Satan who is the god of our planet and the only god. So they are Luciferian. Now, Let's not get confused here. Luciferian or Satanist, it's basically one and the same thing. Mm -hmm. Lucifer is the light side. Yes. Satan is the dark side. It's a yin-yang situation. Yes. So whether you worship from the one angle or the other angle makes no difference to these people. We'll see how this works. Here's a, another quote from another Masonic source. The symbols came to have two meanings. Remember that the Babylonian founders decided to put everything into symbols. Yes, to, because of the language. And then the initiates would understand, but the non-initiated would not, and God would not be able to confuse them anymore. They really underestimate God, <laughs> right? Yeah, because they could be looking at something and it could be something totally different if God wanted to change it. Yeah. But nevertheless, they always underestimate God. So there are two meanings, the esoteric and the exoteric. The esoteric is what they call the real meaning. That's for the inner, for the inner circle. circle. And the exoteric is for the goyim, yes. for the public out there. So the esoteric meaning was the true or original meaning understood by only a few and closely guarded by them. The exoteric meaning was invented or modified explanation intended for the many. The sacred mysteries, which are often mentioned in connection with many ancient religions and which were closely guarded by the initiate, concerned esoteric meanings in the religions of previous times. Mm -hmm. So when you read Christ in the Bible, they read Lucifer. Yeah. When they read the word Logos, they understand Lucifer. These sacred mysteries were very often were merely continuations of the simpler forms of early sex worship carried on by a select few. Martin, that gives you a clue as to why the world is so sexually perverse. Yeah. And not only in terms of the Hollywood aspect. No but right through even to the religious aspects. And masonry in particular has some very sinister little activities which we won't talk about. So let me give an example of how 
the esoteric and exoteric Word. is portrayed mm. in their symbols. Mm. All right? Let's look at the Templars. Templars are basically the driving force of the political religious unification within Catholicism mm -hmm. that is taken to every sphere of life. Okay, so it's a militant part of the church state entity. Yes. So you'll have the Knights of Malta in many, many organizations and of course the Jesuits which are basically the general and the top echelon of mm -hmm. the whole system. So in the book Morals and Dogma, again the top Masonic source, it says, The Templars, like all other secret orders and associations, had two doctrines, one concealed and reserved for the masters, which was Johannism, mm. and the other public, which was the Roman Catholic. Now when it comes to Johannism, that's a very interesting concept. You might know you have the cathedral of st john the divine yeah the name already is a blasphemy mm. saint john the divine mm. saint john wasn't divine no, it, puts him, it gives him godly status it gives him godly status and what goes on in that cathedral is beyond words right now they love to uh, use john the baptist mm. as a front as a symbol but there are two sides to that story. Remember he was beheaded yeah. for his faith for which he stood. And they actually celebrate that beheading because they are on the side of Lucifer. Who initiated the beheading? Lucifer. Yeah, using Herodias, right? And yeah. Salome. It was actually church and state. Yes, <laughs> and Herodias, of course, stands for the mother church and the daughter would be the daughter church. So they would also want to behead the anti-typical yeah. John the Baptist. Wow. The other one that they love to revere is St. Paul. Mm. Wasn't he also beheaded? Yes. Who initiated that beheading? Also Lucifer. So when they use it, they use it as a symbol of victory over the truth. Yeah. So Martin, I took these pictures that we see over here at one of those huge Catholic enclaves with a massive cathedral-like church as well. Mm. Isn't it's a place where Church leaders and state leaders come together to discuss issues mm -hmm. of mutual interest. And in this place, they have a statue here, which they call David. Mm. And they say, this is David taking care of the sheep. So David is the good shepherd over here. But if you look, this is the exoteric, exoteric doctrine. Yeah. For, the, for the goyim. For the goyim. They say that this is David. But if you look at David over here, He's got a pan flute in his hand. David never played the pan flute. Mm. He played the harp, yeah. which was the hand harp, right? Mm. So this is actually a depiction of the god Pan. Yes. And this is wow. the light side uh, okay. of the god Pan, the good side, the good shepherd side. So this is the Lucifer side. So when I saw this and I saw uh, the pan flute in his hand, I knew that this was the god Pan in his light side. So somewhere they must depict him in his evil side mm. as well. So I went looking around and I found the pillars and lo and behold, there you have the god Pan in his evil goat form, half man, half goat. Mm. So this is yin yang. Yeah. And to put it beyond the doubt, they have Janus, the two-headed one up there, which is also the yin yang. So you have the light side and your dark side. You have uh, light magic and you have dark, dark magic. magic white magic white and magic yes well and then white magic and black magic that's it and then uh, as you put it this is the esoteric and exoteric yes meeting because the exoteric is portraying him as david but uh, the esoteric he is the god pan yes and this is of course just art oh, yeah. nothing else but if you look at the renovations that take place, there's a big sign outside. The renovator is Masonic because he has the Masonic symbol on his board. Yeah. Now we could show all that, but you know, it's long time in the making. Let's take another example. This is what St. Paul's Cathedral, which is a Protestant enclave, uh -huh. you know, the one where the king is coronated. 
and King Charles was just coronated there. Mm -hmm. And this is what it looked like in the old days. This is a model that you find in the place. And it was reconstructed to look like this. Mm. Now this reconstruction is a copy of the Vatican. Yeah. Martin, this is an image of the Vatican. That's it. And then if you go and look, the capital of uh, the United States is similar to this again. So it's based on it. They are an image of the beast. Yeah. The beast being Catholicism. And this is an image of the beast also. Correct. The Vatican. Now, this is a temple because it has an altar in it. Now, Protestantism removed all the altars mm. because we've had one complete sacrifice. There's no need for a sacrifice. No. But under the Oxford movement, mm -hmm. which was, of course, driven by the Jesuits, the altar came back into the Anglican Church. And the Mass is again a sacrifice. That's a blasphemy. Yeah. Because by one sacrifice, he has forever made perfect. So this is a temple, but it's not just a Christian temple. It's supposedly a Christian temple, mm. but actually it's a Masonic temple. Yes. And if you go inside, you will see on the ceiling this depiction over here. Martin, what is that? Uh, that is Freemasonry. This is Jesuitical, the all-seeing mm -hmm. eye, and the compass and set square. This is a Masonic temple. So when the king is coronated, mm. and he walks in there with all his regalia, and all his little charms on his chest, one of the most prominent ones will be the Templar's yeah, sign. Yeah, the Knights Templar, the, the Knights of Malta cross. Correct. He will oh. wear that in the middle, and it will also be on his crown. Yeah. And interestingly enough, Martin, he has said that he wants to be the defender of faith. Mm. That's a Masonic concept. That's Fratelli Tutti, bringing them all together. So this is the Exoteric doctrine, this is a church, a Protestant church. Esoteric doctrine, this is an image of the beast, and it is Masonic. Yeah, and it's worshipping Lucifer. In other words, the true religion behind the mm. scenes is Lucifer. Yeah. So we ask ourselves the question, who is Babylon? I think we have answered it, and the Bible is pretty clear. Because if you go to Revelation chapter 17... It talks about the woman riding the beast, mm -hmm. the church controlling the political system. That's what it means. And she has on her forehead, mystery, Babylon, yeah. the mother of all the harlots, right? Yeah. So in other words, she is the main mother, and then she has daughters, yes. other, churches, other churches, other organizations. Mm -hmm. So Babylon originally was the ancient city, and that religion filtered down, and the real harborer of that religion, Baal worship, mm. is today in its fullness found in Roman Catholicism. Mother and child mm. worship, right? Plus all the other doctrines that are associated with it, and the deification of self. Yeah. We've seen that in the Catechism. The question we have to ask ourselves, why is it fallen? Mm -hmm. Now, this message was first given in literal Babylon's time. Yes. And the message is given in anti-typical Babylon's time, right? Yes. And the message was proclaimed in 1844. Yes, at the close of the 2,300 years. Yes. So the first angel's message mm -hmm. was to preach the everlasting gospel. Mm -hmm. The first angel was to say that the time of judgment has come and that one must worship God and give the glory to him. Now, the message was judgment has come and people believed Christ was going to return. But the churches rejected that message. Yes. So the next message was Babylon has fallen, has fallen. Now, Rome had always been fallen. Yes. So which component had now fallen? We'll come to that. Mm. So there's an announcement of the fall of Babylon, but there is not yet a general call out of Babylon. Mm -hmm. And then we have to know what constitutes the wine of Babylon and who serves it and who drinks it. Now we know that Babylon is the ancient religion mm -hmm. disguised 
as a Christian religion for the exoteric, yes. for the Goyim. But really it is a Luciferian religion at its core. Now who is Babylon? We get a clue in 1 Peter 5.13. The church that is at Babylon, elected together with you, saluteth you, and so does Marcus my son. Now the church that is at Babylon, Babylon never existed at this time in mm. So Peter was referring to Rome, Rome. And there's general consensus that he called Rome Babylon. Yeah. Now, the Protestants, did they again make it prominent that Rome was Babylon? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> All right. So let's go back in history. Martin Luther, he wrote The Babylonian Captivity of the Church. And in it he says, that the Babylonian captivity of the church, Martin Luther set forth a reconsideration of the sacramental Christian life that centered on the word. His thesis is that the papacy had distorted the sacraments with its traditions and regulations, transforming them into a system of control and coercion. So he accused Rome of taking the heart out of the gospel negating the word and putting traditions in its place and he called that a Babylonian captivity. Mm -hmm. So the Roman church, according to him, was Babylon. Babylon. Yes. Now Martin, is it possible that Protestantism could fall and become part of Babylon? Yes, if they started compromising. Ah. Grattan Guinness who was a Church of England theologian, in 1887, in his famous book, Romanism and the Reformation, wrote about this occasion, and he says, Rise up, Luther, cry out concerning the Babylonian captivity of the church, burn the papal bull, rouse Germany, but you shall have your match. Satan shall bring forth his Loyola, and Loyola his Jesuits, subtle, learned, saintly in garb and name, protean in form, infinite in disguises, innumerable scholars, teachers, theologians, confessors of princes, politicians, rhetoricians, casuists, instruments keen, unscrupulous, double-edged men fitted to every sphere and every enterprise. They shall swarm against the Church of the Reformation, each one wise in the wisdom and strong in the strength, which is are not from above, but from beneath. Mm. That's pretty straight talk by a Protestant, right? Yeah, and this was also in the 1800s. Yes. Now, Martin, the Oxford movement mm. actually gained this major victory over Protestantism and brought back Roman Catholicism and its traditions and its sacrificial system into the church. And it was done in the same principles that they told you it's going to be done. There was an exoteric um, explanation that Newman did. And then afterwards, he became a cardinal in the Catholic Church. So it meant he was actually working esoteric. Correct. And in 1844, these manuscripts on which the modern Bibles are based mm -hmm were discovered, the Sinaiticus, and Protestantism started swallowing the Jesuitical line, hook, line, and sinker. Plus, they started to embrace the Counter-Reformation theology regarding the papacy. Futurism, which today is evangelical mainstream thinking, and Preterism, which is minority Protestant thinking. Today. But both of them taking you away. Both of them Jesuitical. So when you embrace these teachings, don't you fall? Yeah. You fall because you're with Babylon. All right. So let's go back to typical Babylon. Jeremiah 51 verse 7. Babylon has been a golden cup in the Lord's hand and made all the earth drunken. The nations have drunken of our wine, therefore the nations are mad. Mm. That's a serious allegation. So in the time of Jeremiah, who warned that Babylon was going to take control of Jerusalem, mm -hmm. 
it was because the nations had gone mad yeah. because they were practicing her doctrines. That's it. They were doing all these filthy things. They were so-called worshipping Yahweh mm. while they were actually worshipping Baal. Yeah. So they invoked the name of Yahweh but used the methodology and the theology of Baal. Mm. Isn't that what they're doing today? It's exactly the same today. So when Revelation 14, 8 says, and there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that's the church state mm. union, that great city because she made all the nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, we have the same system. All the nations are, are, are drunk. Well, people can just look around and ask themselves, are the nations mad? They are mad. Look <laughs> at the television. They're mad. Yeah. They've definitely gone mad. Or Revelation 16, verse 19. And the great city was divided into three parts. And the cities of the nations fell, and the great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Accept their system, and you are an enemy of God. Yeah, yeah, you're part of Babylon. Is that an important message? Oh, well, it's if you're going to be part of it, you're going to fall with it. All right. Now, Babylon has a number of components. Revelation 16, 13. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. So here are three components mm -hmm. of the end time Babylon. That's the final complete Babylon. So you have the beast, which is Catholicism. You have the dragon, which according to the scripture is Satan, Satan. himself. Mm -hmm. And you have the false prophet. For there are spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and to the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Now it says here, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watches and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Martin, if you want to keep your garment, you have to keep the garment of Christ's righteousness. Yes. Otherwise you will be naked like Adam and Eve were, right? And he gathered them together into a place, the word there is topos, mm. called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. So this place can be literal, but it can also be figurative. Yeah. Now Babylon is antitypical. It's not a place anymore. No, because it used to be, this is the antitypical. It has a metaphorical meaning, which means mindset. Mm -hmm. Gathered together into the same mindset. They wandered with an O. After the beast, mm. they received the same mindset they had been indoctrinated. And if you accept this, then he will come to you as a thief. You will not expect him. Yeah. But 1 Thessalonians 5, 4 says, But ye, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. Mm. To who was he referring? Brethren. Yes. It means this, like you mentioned before, not neighbor. Yeah, he's speaking to the brethren. They, you won't be overtaking if you... If, if, if you trust in this yeah. word, Martin, you need not be deceived. That's it. But you have to watch. You have to study the circumstances. You cannot drink in every word that comes out of the mouth of Babylon. No. Jesus also said, when they asked him, when will the end come and how will we know and what will the signs be? He said the first words, like you mentioned before, be careful that you are not deceived. Correct. So Martin, there were three components. Now the dragon and the beast have always been in partnership. Mm. How do we know that? Well, Revelation 13 verse 2 says, And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. So here we have the conglomerate beast of Daniel chapter 7, putting all those ideologies of all those kingdoms together. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. So the dragon and the beast were always together. Mm. So all dragon religions where the spirit world is invoked, that would be any religion out there that invokes spirit beings. Yeah. 
that's shamanism or any one of the other religions. They have dragon power. But the beast gets a seat and great authority. We talk about the bishop's seat. And the seat of the bishop of Rome is in Rome. Mm. That is the city. And when he speaks, he speaks from his seat. He mm. speaks ex cathedra, infallibly. And they worship the dragon which gave power unto the beast. And they worship the beast saying, who is like unto the beast? So if you're in the system, Martin, you're a Luciferian. You're worshipping the dragon. You're worshipping the devil. Just like Blavatsky said. Yeah. And Masons do exactly the same. Mm -hmm. And those that do not know about it haven't studied it deeply enough. That's unfortunate, but it's true. 1 Corinthians 10.20 says, But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that you should have fellowship with devils. That's putting it pretty plainly. You see, that's the same as you just said. You don't have the truth, you're worshipping devils. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. You must make a choice. You see, but they do this. They do this. They have it, uh, part, are partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of the devils right. because they have this whole esoteric and eso exoteric thing going on. All right, 1 Timothy 4 verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. So in the latter times, Martin, we're talking about this. In 1844, the message went out, Babylon has fallen. Mm. Is it possible that some had actually followed seducing spirits and doctrines of devils yeah. and became ecumenical? Revelation 16, 14, For they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. To that mindset, that topos, mm. where you have to make a decision. Am I going to run mm -hmm. with this fratelli tutti? Or am I going to run with what the Bible says? Yeah. If I run with what the Bible says, do I become the enemy of the system? Yes, you do. You stand out like a sore thumb. Yep. You are you are against peace and goodwill. You are. You are against the common good, Martin. Oh, you have to get taken out. All right. Revelation 9 verse 20. And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, talking about the last seven plagues, yet repented not of the works of their hands that they should not worship devils. And idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood which neither can see nor hear nor walk. Do we have them in all the religious systems of the world except pure Protestantism? Yeah. Yes. We yeah. have idols of wood and stone all over okay. in all the religious systems. And idols of gold. But Martin, they're worshipping Devil. devils. That's what the Bible says. So let's ask a question. What constitutes the wine of Babylon? Who serves it and who drinks it? The nations have gone mad. Did Protestantism receive a message from God via the reformers that they had to break with the Babylonian system of Rome? Definitely. Yes, and they had time a little less than 500 years until 1844 to make a decision. Correct. So Martin, if they knew the truth, and now they embrace the lie. Do they then fall? Yes. So Babylon has fallen. It mm -hmm. didn't apply to Rome, which was already fallen. It didn't apply to the dragon, who had fallen already in heaven. Mm -hmm. It applies to Protestantism, yeah. which now joined in and also fell. Matthew nine seventeen. Neither do men put new wine into old bottles, else the bottles break, and the wine runneth out, and the bottles perish. But they put new wine into new bottles and both are preserved. If you want to have new wine, the doctrine of salvation in Christ, you have to become a new person. Yes. You must be born again. Cleanse. Not, you cannot have an old wineskin with all this new doctrine. So if you want to stick to your traditions and you want to stick to all of this nonsense, this exoteric stuff that has been fed to you, Martin, you can't do it. 
you are worshipping on the wrong side. Now, two great lies stand out as wine. Hmm. And these two lies will unify humanity. Against? Against the gospel. Yes. And they are the immortality of the soul in Sunday worship. Now, we're going to deal with them in some details. We're not going to deal with the Sunday worship issue in any detail at all in this lecture. But we're going to deal with the immortality of the soul a little bit. Yeah. The reason we're not dealing with the Sunday one is because that forms part of the third angel's message, which is on its way. Correct. Through the two great errors, the immortality of the soul and Sunday sacredness, Satan will bring the people under his deceptions. In other words, they will drink the wine. While the former lays the foundation for spiritualism, the latter creates a bond of sympathy with Rome. The Protestants of the United States will be foremost in stretching their hands across the gulf to grasp the hand of spiritualism. They will reach over the abbots to clasp the hands of the Roman power and under the influence of this threefold union, this country will follow in the steps of Rome in trampling on the rights of conscience. This comes from the great controversy. Protestantism will grab the hand of spiritism. Mm. And they will grab the hand of Rome. And then the dragon component will be in Protestantism, mm. spiritism. The beast component will be controlling them. Mm -hmm. And they will be a false prophet. Yeah. In three. other words, they will teach lies. Now, when literal Babylon attacked the church, mm. did Jeremiah warn against false prophets? Yes. So Jeremiah was standing for the truth, mm -hmm. and he warned against the false prophets in his own system. Yeah, he was standing in the gate. Think about that. Mm. Let's have a look at ecumenism. This comes from the New World Encyclopedia. The contemporary ecumenical movement for Protestants is often said to have started with the 1910 Edinburgh Missionary Conference. So this is for Protestants. When did they join the ecumenical movement? Mm. However, this conference would not have been possible without the pioneering ecumenical work of the Christian youth movements. The Young Men's Christian Association, founded in 1844, the Young Women's Christian Association, founded just a few years later in 1855, the World Student Christian Federation in 1895, led by Methodist layman John R. Mott, former YMCA staff, and in 1910, the General Secretary of the WCF, the World Mission Conference, marked the largest Protestant gathering to that time. Prior to this, it was only individuals. Mm -hmm. So a starting date for the ecumenical movement as far as Protestants is concerned is 1844. Yeah. They started to imbibe the wine. So does that qualify them for a fallen state? Definitely, because it fits right into the when the message went out, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. 1844. So Catholics and Lutherans confirm commitment to communion. The Pontifical Council for Promoting Christian Unity and the Lutheran World Federation underscore their commitment to walk together on their common journey from conflict to communion. What about the Babylonian captivity of the church? Aren't they taking their hands and say, handcuff us again, we yep. want to be in the Babylonian we want to be community? In there. Mm. Aren't they then Babylon? Yes. They have become Babylon. They have fallen. They have fallen. They're going back into Babylonian captivity. The Bible says, get out. Yeah. So let's ask some Protestants that were still awake. This is 1946. This is Moody Press. Martin, 1946, it's quite a while back, right? The Reformers regarded the Holy Scriptures as the sole rule of faith and practice, and the sons of the Reformers throw the sole rule out of the window, torn to shreds by the deft, impious hands of the critic. Mm. Does that qualify them for becoming Babylon? Then you move over to the Babylonian city. With the Bible goes the God of the Bible. 
And when we charge Rome with literal idolatry for her veneration of images, relics and so forth, she comes back with an accusation of intellectual idolatry. And that Protestantism, having rejected the God of Revelation, has created a new God, the product of apostate thinking. So here you have higher criticism, yeah. which is actually steered by Jesuits in the background. Exactly. It's part of the exoteric part. Movement. Yes, you have to change the entire religion in order to do this. Rome is not afraid of modernism. It is a fruitful fishing pool because the human heart cannot be satisfied with the vague, vaporous uncertainties of modernism. Rome addresses herself to those who are under the influence of that emasculated brand of Protestantism and offers the authority of the church founded by Jesus Christ in place of the bewildering uncertainties of indifferentism. Modern. They accept the authority of Rome. It has never moved. <laughs> they go back to the mother. So she's the mother of harlots. Yes. Because the harlots have embraced idolatry and come back to her. Come back and be part of Babylon again. Now, we have no king but Jesus, mm -hmm. said the Protestant reformers in Scotland. Now they're shouting, we have no king but the Pope. The Caesar. Let's go to the time, 1844. They rejected the literal coming of Christ. Mm. And they were a little bit afraid, and many of them thought it might happen, but when it finally didn't happen, and he didn't come in 1844, they were so relieved. They were so happy. Now, what did Luther say about the book of Daniel? Mm. He writes, Therefore we bid that all earnest Christians read the book of Daniel, to whom it will be a consolation and a great profit in these last miserable times. And when these things begin to pass, look up and lift up your head because your redemption is at hand. For the same reason we find in Daniel that all the dreams and visions, how fearful they might be, end always in joy and gladness with the coming of Christ and his kingdom. Yea, for that chief article of faith, the coming of Christ, these visions were given, explained, and recorded. Based on the book of Daniel, they began to understand the book of Revelation. Yes, in Luther's time. Also. In Luther's time. And they were very clear as to who the beasts were in the book of Daniel and how that the beast in Revelation chapter 13 was a conglomerate of those political religious systems. They were absolutely crystal clear. By the time you get to 1844, they had drunk so much wine yeah. that they forgot that doctrine. That's why we had to have the first angel message, to wake them up again. To wake them up. And the coming of Christ was the message. Mm. And this is the chief article, he's coming again. Did Luther believe it? Yes. Did they believe it after all those years? Uh, no. No. They had to be waken up again. No. In fact, they threw the people out of the churches mm. that actually believed yeah. it. Luther and the Second Coming. In 1538 he wrote, in commenting on the prevalent godlessness, Luther said, I hope that day is not far off and we shall still see it. Did he have an expectation? Yes, he was longing for it. He writes, I hope the last day will not tarry over a hundred years because God's word will be taken away again and a great darkness will come for scarcity of ministers of the word. Was his prediction Yeah, true? that's prophetic. <laughs> <laughs> he was speaking prophetically. He didn't even know it because that's exactly what happened. It was almost 400 years. God is so patient. He gives people the truth and they reject it. They go back to Rome mm. and they become part of Babylon. Babylon is fallen. It's fallen. Here's another one. Oh Christ, my Lord, look down upon us and bring upon us thy day of judgment and destroy the brood of Satan in Rome. Did the Protestants in 1844 still shout that, Martin? No. Would they shout it today? No. Never. No, no. There sits the man of whom the Apostle Paul wrote in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 that he will oppose and exalt himself above all that is called God, that man of sin, the son of perdition. What else is papal power but sin and corruption? It leads souls to destruction under thine own name, O Lord. I hope that day of judgment is soon to dawn. 
things can and will not become worse than they are at this time. Man, <laughs> have I got news for him? Well, no. Yeah, uh, I think he will. He might rewrite that if he <laughs> know, knows what's so. going on. The papal see is practicing iniquity to its heights. He suppresses the law of God and exalts his commandments above the commandments of God. Martin, Martin, wouldn't you want to be a Luther at this time? Yeah. You've got the right first name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. Huh? Yeah. Do they still believe this? No, unfortunately. No. So have they become part of Babylon? Yes. So let's have a look at the doctrine of the literal return of Christ. It was rejected in 1844, and this led to a spiritualization of the doctrine of Christ. This is what I'm writing. Hmm. And this opened the floodgates for doctrines of demons to enter the churches. Isn't that a terrible statement to make? It is, unless it's true. So 2 Corinthians 11 warns against this thing. For if he that cometh preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached. Is that possible? Yeah, that's what we're seeing. Or you receive another spirit. Can Protestantism receive another spirit? And again, it did. Which you have not received. Or another gospel, which you have not accepted. You might well bear with them. They're very apt to absorb false doctrine. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you unto the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. This happened in Paul's day. Uh -huh. How much more so will it happen when Babylon has fallen? Be not deceived. Many will depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. This is a letter 263. And Martin, it has happened. It's quoting the Bible. We have now before us the alpha of this danger. The omega will be of a most startling nature. Can it even become worse even within the realms of God's people? Yes. Because when Babylonian tentacles start creeping in, then you start losing or compromising and you start moving slowly back to Babylon. Martin, what is an Adventist? He's looking forward to the soon coming of Christ. All right. Now, spiritualism spiritualizes it away. Mm. So let's see how they do that. Let's listen to Blavatsky. Blavatsky about the second coming. The coming of Christ means the presence of Christos in a regenerated world and not at all the actual coming in body of Christ Jesus. Gone is a literal coming, right? Mm -hmm. This is spiritism. This is occultism. This is masonry. This is esoteric doctrine. Mm. Christ, the true esoteric savior, is no man, but the divine principle in every human being. This is devil language. That's it. He who strives to resurrect the spirit crucified in him by his own terrestrial passions and buried deep in the sepulchre of his sinful flesh, he who has the strength to roll back the stone of matter from the door of his own inner sanctuary, he has the risen Christ in him. Esoteric doctrine, diseased, yeah. satanic, demonic, doctrines of devils. This is what it is the most revered prophet of the New Age. And she was the influencer of Alice A. Bailey, Alice A. Bailey in the United Nations. All of this is infiltrated everywhere. And the Jesuits. In, and it's in society. It's in everything, in churches. All right, so the deification of self is a doctrine. Mm. Let's make sure again, the Vatican official foundational starting point is man. Rome states in its Vatican II documents, this comes from 1962, Martin, mm. it is man himself who must be saved. It is mankind that must be renewed. It is man, therefore, is the key to this discussion. Man considered whole and entire with body, soul, heart, conscience, mind, and will. This is the reason why the sacred synod, Vatican II, in proclaiming the noble destiny of man and affirming an element of the divine in him, 
offers to cooperate unreservedly with mankind in fostering a sense of brotherhood to correspond to this destiny of theirs. Is that evil or not? Blavatsky could just as well have written this. Absolutely. Mm. This is Fratelli Tutti. Yeah. This is Christian. And that is why Pope Francis, a Jesuit, was chosen to push the agenda. Mm. It is the doctrine of devils. Because he knows the esoteric meaning of everything. And if you take part in this, Martin? Then you're worshipping devils. You're worshipping devils. Here is Alfred H. Paul's book, 17 Reasons Why I Left the Tongues Movement. Mm -hmm. Now remember that the Bible says you receive another Jesus. Yep. In other words, they're actually saying you receive a Jesus that never died for you because you can become one yourself. Yeah. And you receive another spirit. Mm -hmm. Now the tongues movement is very strong in the Protestant world. You were part of that yeah. before you came out of Babylon. Yeah. I wish that I were wrong, but all signs at the present indicate that the charismatic movement could be the common denominator for a worldwide ecumenical organization or church. It's gluing everyone together, Martin. Especially the one that was not very easy to do, and that was Rome and Protestantism. All right. Now, when the, when the Lord separated the languages, and when he called his church out to be separate and not to be part of anything, is that ecumenical or anti-ecumenical? It's anti-ecumenical. Okay, so the tongues movement pushes you towards ecumenism. Yes. What spirit is it then? Is it the spirit of the Lord? Is he fighting against himself? No. Because Hinduism speaks in tongues. Mm -hmm. Shamanism speaks in tongues. And uh, Satanists speak in tongues. Huh? Of course. Now you've got Catholics speaking tongues. You've got Evangelicals speaking in tongues. Yes. Like this guy says, it's a common denominator to glue them together. But the true tongues were literal languages, te idia dialecto, in their yes. own mother tongue. Martin, is this spirit working contrary to the spirit of God? 100% against And it. is the spirit becoming the norm other than the word? Yes, the spirit, the spirit experience. Okay. So in the past, all attempts to bring about ecumenicity on the basis of faith, belief, or doctrine have failed. But in the charismatic un movement, unity is attained not by the unanimity of doctrine, but on the basis of a common religious experience. Mm. Now, Martin, can you now understand why a queen or a king can knight a religious figure and one who openly embraces Satanists like many of these rock stars yeah. that are knighted and become sir. So now it makes sense because how else can you... It's yin-yang? Yeah. Okay. To them, largely, doctrine is not the important thing, but the experiences. So it is not surprising that in charismatic circles, people of many denominational backgrounds and doctrines can all worship and fellowship together. Not because they agree on doctrine, but because they agree on a common religious experience. This is a very dangerous trend. Why? Because setting truth aside in order to have unity will ultimately put the one who is the truth, the Lord Jesus, outside of the movement. And that is what's happening. Babylon did it fall. Yes. Did the floodgates open to take the hand of spiritism? Yes. Because this is spiritism. This is spiritism. And they use one of the powerful tools, music, to get this done. And music uses hypnotism yeah. by putting you into an altered state of consciousness. So it's back to spirit spiritism. Martin, this is, this is a very heavy discussion. I realize this, but how far can it go? Luther and Tyndall are dead. Many believe the soul is immortal and remains conscious apart from the body after death, but early reformers Martin Luther and William Tyndall recognized what the Bible teaches about this, that those who have died have no awareness while awaiting a future resurrection. So once you start believing that you can talk to the deceased, mm -hmm. you are where Babylon is. 
Because Rome tells you to invoke Mary and the saints. Yeah. They are deceased. They know nothing. They are dead. Yeah. They are asleep. Sleep. So, one so here now you can talk to all of these as well. You, you can talk to them or if you actually uh, believe that you go either to hell or to heaven right after death, you're sitting with the same problem. So Martin Luther and Tyndall, both of them gave us the Bible in the common tongue. Martin Luther in German, Tyndall in English. Mm. Right? They believed in soul sleep. They translated the Bible. They had to mull over every word. Mm -hmm. This was their conviction. Not only they, but uh, John Frith believed it. John Milton. He was the English poet, polemicist, man of letters and civil servant, Commonwealth of England. Uh, under its Council of State and later under Cromwell, he wrote at a time of religious flux and political upheaval and is best known for his epic poem, Paradise Lost, written in blank verse. He believed in soul sleep. Wycliffe, mm. the morning star of the Reformation. Maury suggests that Wycliffe and Tyndall taught the doctrine of soul sleep as the answer to the Catholic teaching of purgatory and masses for the dead. And it makes sense because yes. according to the Catholic system uh, teaching, the devil was right when he told Eve, you will surely not die. Correct. Solomon, this is what Martin Luther wrote. Solomon judges that the dead are asleep. This is written in Old English, so it's not misspelled. And feel nothing at all. For the dead lie there, accompting, in other words, cognitizing, neither days nor years. But when they are awoken, they shall seem to have slept scarce one minute. That's what Martin Luther believed. Now today, you can have a divine connection in your pocket. You can get an app and discover a new interactive way to engage with your faith through the text with Jesus. And he will answer you. And the way in which he writes, Martin, mm. is exactly the same way in which the esoteric write. I used to be very involved in the New Age movement. Mm -hmm. And he would write, My dear ones, my enlightened ones, my loved ones, my disciples. That's how he would write. And this is how the answers here are also given. It is nauseating to me. But now you can communicate be with Jesus. But the reason it's nauseating to you is because you understand the esoteric um, hidden nuances of this. Correct. Now Where Jesus is not sleeping. He is resurrected. Yeah. Don't so get me wrong. So other people that will read it exoterically will probably not see it in the same way. But once you've gone through this lecture, hopefully you can al also start seeing, wait, this is not according to how the, bi the biblical Jesus will talk. Correct. So here's another example. The New York Post controversial new AI app allows you to text with Jesus and Satan. <laughs> That's interesting. All right. It's not every day that the spiritual realm intersects with smartphone text, but in an era of chat box and AI, even the biblical figures aren't immune. Welcome to the world of text with Jesus where you're just a tap away from a conversation with the holy and for a price, the not so holy. Deepening faith through text with Jesus. For those longing for a more personal connection to their faith, this app might be the digital salvation they are seeking. Designed with devoted Christians in mind, text with Jesus promises interaction with figures like Jesus, Mary, Joseph, Peter and Matthew. Now, Mary, Joseph, Peter, and Matthew, according to the scripture, are what? Asleep. Asleep. They know nothing. They were awake at the resurrection. You are speaking, if they answer, esoterically. You're getting doctrines of devils. Yes. So this is spiritism on steroids. Because Laiola's exercises tells you to put yourself into a situation and listen to what Mary or Joseph has to say to you. Now this is just one app. There are apps now that enable you to speak to your deceased yeah. loved ones. So is he pushing the immortality of the soul issue? Completely. Is it uniting the various religions because yeah. they all believe exactly the same? Yes. 
Don't they invoke the dead? That is necromancy. It is forbidden mm -hmm. by God because you are speaking to demons. And just to put it out there, that ma tells you how dangerous it is if you look at Hollywood productions. Like, for instance, even children's movies are full of necromancing and magic and all the speaking to to, to, to deceased ones. Well, we could go on forever and ever speaking about the sins of Babylon. Mm. But just for interest's sake, I'm just going to briefly mention here the treasury of merit mm, mm. on which indulgences were based. So this treasure that the church has where it can dish out or the Pope can dish out merit for those that lack some. This treasury includes as well the prayers and good works of the Blessed Virgin Mary. They are Im truly immense, unfathomable, and even pristine in their value before God. In the treasury too are the prayers and good works of all the saints. They're all dead. They know nothing. So this is necromancy. This yeah. is the doctrine of devils. Yeah. It's Babylon. So as part of a greater effort to use social media to connect with the Catholics worldwide, the Pope will start relieving punishment for your sins via social media. Are we now going from the ridiculous to the sublime? Well, shouldn't Protestantism realize that they're dealing with Babylon? Of, of course, and you have to know who Babylon is. All right, if you know that the papacy is the beast component yeah. of Babylon and that he is in cahoots with the dragon, and now he's dishing out relief from your punishment okay. via an app. Yeah, so you can WhatsApp him, and there you go. Shouldn't you say, oh, what am I doing in an ecumenical council with these people? Am I not in cahoots with the doctrines of devils? This will pull you into Babylon again if you mingle with us. Correct. Vatican offers time of purgatory to follow uh, to followers of Pope Francis's tweets. So you can relieve your punishment, which doesn't exist because there is no purgatory in the scriptures anyway, but you just follow his tweets. Isn't, isn't this demonic? Yes, it's doctrines of devils. There are three ways of obtaining these indulgences. You can make a pilgrimage to the shrine. Is that salvation by works? Yes, that's uh, the same as Babylon, Babel. Or pray before any statue of Our Lady of Fatima. Is that idolatry? Idolatry. Isn't that forbidden by the second commandment, which they have removed from their catechism? catechism? And the third way is to obtain a plenary indulgence. It applies to people because of age, illness, or other serious cause are unable to get around. So all you have to do is say, I want to do it, but I can't. You'll also get it. Is this idolatry? Is this Babylonian? Bab Babylonian doctrine at its best. So the announcement, this is again what I wrote, the announcement of the fall of Babylon is repeated by the angel of Revelation 18. We've just looked at the angel of Revelation 14. Mm. The second angel. The second angel. Why Babylon has fallen. We've identified Babylon. We saw that the component that fell in 1844 was Protestantism. And it's hooked into the system and is part of Babylon now. Yeah. So what comes out of the mouth of the dragon, the dragon religions, what comes out of the mouth of Catholicism is exoteric doctrine, yeah. while they actually believe esoteric doctrine. Mm -hmm. And what comes out of the mouth of the false prophet is no better than what they were. Nothing. Because they've become part of them. And they have to hide their distinctive belief in Jesus Christ not to offend mm. those that don't believe that he's the way, the truth, and the life. So you hear the whole time them speaking of Jesus Christ. And yes, but it's an esoteric Christ. It's exactly. When they're making you think it's an exoteric Christ. So the scripture in Revelation 18, this scripture points forward to a time when the announcement of the fall of Babylon as made by the second angel of Revelation, is to be repeated with the additional mention of the corruptions which have entered the various organizations that constitute Babylon since that message was first given in the summer of 1844. That's when ecumenism started. Yeah. That's when evolution theory mm -hmm. went into the world. 
These announcements, uniting with the third angel's message, constitute the final warning to be given to the inhabitants of the earth. Martin, we're not there yet. We still have to do a lecture on this. That's it. So our Babylon talk now was just an introduction. This is an introduction because now we will move over to but the more pointed parts of Babylon. But before we get to Revelation 18, we first have to do the third angel. Yes. So in our next discussion, we'll have to speak about the importance of the third angel's message. I hope that the viewers will understand what Babylon is. I hope they will understand, Martin, why it is important to recognize what Babylon stands for mm. and that you cannot be associated with it. No, because it's fallen. Fallen. You're going to fall together with it if you get correct. In and if you are in a system or a component of that system, you have to separate yourself. Mm. But we'll come to that. Before the separation, the final separation will take place, there first has to be a third angel. Yeah. Let's wait for that for next time. Thank Let's you. pray. Heavenly Father, the sad story of the fall of Babylon, the dragon, the beast, and then sadly the false prophet. Lord, help us not to be part of Babylonian systems, but to embrace the truth, because you are the way, the truth, and the life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.